Hi, how are y'all? I um, have taken up black coffee again, don't ask. It's been years since I've had black coffee on a regular basis. I kind of love it because I forgot what it meant to be energized, but also I'm getting those good old dehydration headaches that I remember. So keeping water on standby, it's fine. It's nothing to be concerned about, it's cool. Mmm, tastes like burnt. <laughs> hello, hi, welcome, whatever. Um, hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, I'm Skilly Biscuit. And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. <laughs> This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the leading online creative learning community. With thousands of inspiring classes, Skillshare allows you to explore new skills, develop existing ones, and get lost in endless creativity. From film, creative writing, music, to web development, Skillshare has you covered with videos that can propel your creative passions forward. On a personal note, just yesterday I was telling my therapist that I need to get better at more efficiently doing my job as a creative. Cause you know, I'm a wee bit chaotic a controlled chaos, you know, Capricorn, Aries, gang, gang. And when I saw the class Productivity for Creatives, build a system that brings out your best by Thomas Frank. I said, is this fate? Is this a sign? Let's go, Thomas. Teach me how to not be a mess and get all my creative work done. Bless you and your work, Thomas. And my subscribers get to figure out all that Skillshare has to offer. Because for the first thousand people that click on the link below, you get a one month free trial. So hurry and secure your chance to explore your creativity today. Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. And let's get into the debauchery. Last week, I was still stuck in the pit that is passion flicks. I'm, I'm not doing another passion flicks <laughs> But I was in the pit of passion flicks as we looked at another movie from that god-awful cesspool called Wicked. And I couldn't ignore it because it was their first like delving into the supernatural. And uh, girl, a hot mess, a hot pile of boo-boo. <laughs> so if you haven't seen that video, feel free to check it out up above. Or you can check it out in the bad movies and a beat playlist. Okay, so this week. This week we're returning to the Tyler Perry universe. Ever since I made my video at this point over a year ago about a fall from grace, I've had so many people, more than any other Tyler Perry film that's ever been recommended to me, everyone wanted me to talk about Acrimony, 2018, Taraji P. Henson playing another mad black woman who's done wrong by another dark skinned black man. There's also discussion of mortgages or something at some point, you know, the very like tropey stuff from Tyler Perry. Acrimony is a 2018 drama thriller that upon its release was quickly rejected by the arbiters of taste and audiences alike, referred to as quote, trash. And I find that perplexing in the sense that all Tyler Perry movies <laughs> So for one to rise above them all and be the one that everyone's like, this, no, this is Tyler Perry trash. And I say, hmm. And so around that time, so about a year ago, I watched it and I never got around to making this video because A, again, I feel like Tyler Perry of all people make much worse <laughs> films than this. Two, A and two, A and B, I may think that this movie is kind of a stealth masterpiece. Or if not a stealth masterpiece, certainly an accidental one. I know you think I'm joking and you think I'm being facetious in the same way of like, oh, it's a masterpiece in the same way like a Neil Breen movie is a masterpiece. And it's like, no, I'm dead serious. Like this is actually not a perfect movie, but it's, I'd give it a solid B minus, like dead ass. And so <laughs> I swiftly, you know, went to Twitter as I do for everything. And I was like, not me having to write a script like supporting acrimony and calling it a stealth masterpiece. But here we are today, baby. Art ho Kenny, big bitch. We gonna break down well. Acrimony is actually not trash. It's actually a decent movie, okay? Now, like I even said in the Fall From Grace movie, I, you know, I do find Tyler Perry to be quite the menace. He's incredibly egotistical in a lot of things, but I feel like we have other evidence of that than this 
movie is my point. I feel like he's done a lot of shit, but this movie isn't the most egregious of all of the crappy movies that he's made. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to go on record that I, not sarcastic, I think it's like a really sophisticated, is that the word I wanna go for? Sophisticatedly campy and cathartic melodrama. Yeah, I'm being that bitch today. I'm being that annoying person. Y'all just don't see the genius. <laughs> but like I alluded to before, I found it quite confusing actually that people hated this movie so much. So I ended up doing something that I try to avoid doing in the sense of when I'm making these videos because I don't want other people's opinions to kind of thwart my review and thoughts on things. But I decided to actually do a little research into why people hated it so much. And one of the videos I came across was from For Harriet, shout out. That's a really cool commentary channel. She uh, released a video around the time the movie came out and essentially deemed it as the worst Tyler Perry movie ever. And I'm presuming this is before A Fall From Grace came out because there's no damn way that with A Fall From Grace out, you thought. Girl, ciao. Anyway, I was like, okay, great. This is someone who's willing to deem it as the worst thing to come from Tyler Perry. I need, I'm curious why. And from what I garnered from their video, as well as like the comments in that video, more so even than just the video, was this kind of frustration around Tyler Perry and his, his propensity to caricaturize angry black women, you know, TM. That trope of the angry black woman and the caricature of that angry black woman, as well as sort of the trope of like, taking on black men as construction projects, as like something to build up and to bring into fruition, something to wait for and to placate. Black men have to be waited on and be patient for, and that that is the primary goal of a woman. And I see where that criticism comes from. I do, especially in the in this grand scope of, again, Tyler Perry's propensity to making films like that. However, whether he meant to or not, that is not at all what I got from this specific film. And again, I don't know, maybe I'm giving Tyler Perry too much credit. <laughs> at least from this particular film, that is not quite the narrative I garnered from it. Quite the opposite, really. As an audience, who tends to be largely black if you're watching Tyler Perry. I don't know a whole lot of non-black people that are watching a bunch of Tyler Perry. I think that we as a black audience will kind of project <laughs> those that view onto this film because it's easy to do so. Whereas I think this movie is actually suggesting again, possibly inadvertently, something a lot more subtle than black women be angry and black men need to be waited on until they reach fruition and until they've incubated into themselves and been coddled into themselves enough to come out of this cocoon as a fully realized, successful man, right? Whereas how I watched the film, I thought of it less about angry black woman, you know, the TM, the trademark, the idea, idea of the angry black woman as a phenomenon and ultimately as a stereotype. Instead, I thought of it more so as a singular woman who is black and angry, which is a nuanced but subtle difference. I don't think of it as settling for the construction piece of a black man, but instead that people are under construction and that may or may not be finished at any point, right? It becomes less about those things, maybe not entirely independent of them, but less about those things. And more so this film is a culmination of choices. And I think that's the more interesting and nuanced topic there based off of the information that they have and based off of the ideas and the fears and the insecurities and the aspirations that each of them have together and separately they make choices and those choices have to work into this grand dios idea of life of fate and the unknown that ultimately i know you're really sitting there like kendall are you really doing this for tyler perry yes i am i'm really doing this for tyler perry and so all of that reaches this grand climax where at the core, no one's good or bad. They are the very distillation of those choices that leads them to this fateful night on the boat. I feel like compared to other Tyler Perry works, i.e. Diary of a Mad Black Woman, like there is this focus on, this is what a mad black woman is like. Less focal than say that movie, this movie is more so less focused on their blackness and just coincidentally because it's made by Tyler Perry played by black people. I think what's really 
fascinating. Again, I don't know if Tyler Perry tried to do this. I, <laughs> again, maybe giving him way too much credit, or this could be just like a spark of accidental genius. But I think the movie ultimately becomes more of a commentary on anger itself, as opposed to the angry black woman, right? And what I find fascinating about this film, that we follow a woman who's angry and we follow her over the course of 20 years, that ultimately leads her to this anger. Cause you gotta wonder, a person who's so f angry, you gotta ask why, like what happened, <laughs> bitch? And so we follow her on that course of the, the sending anger for 20 years, the, the deep seated resentment that sets in and the scenarios that that continue to make that set in and the choices made that were fueled by that anger and resentment and mistrust and all those emotions. Ultimately, by the end of the movie, you get this sort of cautionary tale of what happens when you let that anger fester. What happens when you let that anger destroy you and possibly everyone around you. So again, I don't know if Tyler Perry was trying to do that. <laughs> I think it's quite the quite the conversation piece. And let's be fair, how often is something from Tyler Perry fodder for like thoughtful conversation on human behavior, like not at all. Don't get me wrong, this movie is not perfect by any means, especially execution wise. Uh, there's some uh, mess going on with green screen. There's also um, an almost supernatural element that came out of nowhere. I was like, huh, huh, what? I think it has something, right? Which is saying a lot again for a Tyler Perry film because most things from Tyler Perry have very, very, very little. <laughs> so without further ado, this is Tyler Perry's 2018 drama, Acrimony. So one thing that I would like to applaud this movie for right off the bat is that it's one of the rare movies from Tyler Perry that doesn't have a cameo from Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry has a, has a tendency to not let an entire movie go without him showing up in some way. And in the context of a movie like this that theoretically is supposed to be taken quite seriously, it, it ends up being this sort of like, where's Waldo memification of whatever movie he's in. Cause it's like, there he is. Again, his f***ing inflated ego is so large that he just has to get dressed up and be somebody in this movie. And so because he's not there, it lends to a more immersive situation. Cause you're not being pulled out. The fourth wall isn't being broken and you're like, here he is again. <laughs> but the film opens and we swiftly meet our main character played by Taraji P. Henson. Her name is Melinda. Melinda is a woman, presumably maybe in her early to mid forties. Melinda is there being sentenced to anger management because she's been harassing someone. We then see the title screen acrimony in which it actually um, shows the definition for acrimony, meaning like a deep bitterness, anger, resentment, etc. Actually is the first of several sort of key term cards throughout the entire movie. And some people didn't like them. I personally really did. They felt like a placeholder or kind of a chapter marker of Melinda's descent into madness throughout the movie. But apparently I'm in the minority. <laughs> but okay. But we end up seeing one of the first shots, which is Melinda in her counseling session for anger management. Though again, this quality doesn't stay necessarily in every single shot throughout the movie, but this particularly, this beautiful wide angle shot that slowly pans in, so good. And this scene is so important for a few reasons. One, of course, it establishes that she is the angry one, right? Which we could have assumed. Two, it shows that she feels a particular entitlement to the level of anger she feels. Do you feel that you're entitled to this anger? It's like asking me if I'm entitled to being hungry. Three, that the anger that she feels is so righteous that it can't be extinguished by anything that her wrongdoers have done. Peak of her anger that nothing can really stop her from being angry. It's not me, that son of a bitch owes me. You don't think he owes Every damn breath in his body. In the context, again, of other Tyler Perry films, this may make you think like, wow, here's another very, 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 very angry black woman again. Like, here we go again. But I think what makes this movie a little bit more, I don't know, self-aware, is that the word choice I wanna use? Is that it does explicitly from the jump bring up the frustrations that the character feels in that she feels as though she's playing into a stereotype of this big, thematic idea 
and stereotype of the angry black woman. Every time a black woman gets mad, she's a stereotype. Don't tell me I don't have a right to be angry. So in a way, from the gate, the movie insists that this is not a conversation about big idea, big world black woman anger. This is a woman who is angry and happens to be black. And I find it a little frustrating that even in the context of displaying black women's anger, it has to be seen as the stereotype of angry black women. You get what I'm saying? It's like black women can't just be angry. <laughs> it's black angry angry black woman stereotype. Their anger isn't allowed to be their own. It's it's a working mechanism cog in the stereotype of black women's anger. What I was trying to say, and I thought of the better word choice, is that essentially being angry as a black woman is in and of itself a political statement in this grandiose idea of black women anger. You can't singularly be angry. This isn't her playing into the stereotypes of angry black women. She is a woman who's been wronged and is angry as a human being <laughs> because of that and has not figured out good ways to cope with that anger. And I think that's what's really interesting. Again, probably completely on accident <laughs> about the setup of the movie. Again, it's not interrogating angry black women, it's interrogating anger itself. And specifically anger that has cause and is righteous and has a place and has a purpose. And we, again, can empathize with it as we follow her story, but can also be completely and utterly all consuming. This therapy session serves as the mechanism of how she tells her story because her therapist is like, well, damn, why are you so angry? She says it better than that, but tell me the story. What led us here that made you this pissed <laughs> all the fucking time? And so we take the journey back 20 some odd years ago when Melinda was in college. And that is where she bumped into her ex-husband. Well, she met her ex-husband, Robert. But they meet on this rainy day as she's running out of class and she sort of in the present postulates on the concept of rain and water and how just strange things happen to her. It's of course, supposed to be foreshadowing. She runs and bumps into Robert and she has quite the bizarre, <laughs> sort of like off kilter response to bumping into somebody. But in the grand scheme of things, this is kind of indicative of Melinda's character anyway. But Robert, after their scuffle, whatever, comes to her dorm room and tells her, hey, I think you got some of my papers when we bumped into each other. And she's like really mean and rude to him. And we're swiftly introduced to kind of their dichotomic interactions, right? She's very gruff and angry and rude and aggressive. And he's this like soft, mild mannered person, which at first was annoying, but then as the kind of events unfold, I actually found that quite interesting, particularly Robert in the sense that he is this very like soft and, and gentle person, but he ends up being the worse the whole movie. <laughs> and it's not that he just suddenly turns into this very aggressive monster. He's still this kind of like soft and gentle. It's like, you should be there for me person, but he's the fucking worst. And I actually really liked it. That was quite, that was quite, again, quite subtle and nuanced. And I just, anywho. So Robert is studying to be an engineer. Uh, a mechanical engineer more specifically. And they start hanging out. They start like starting to like each other. And he lets her know that he is trying to create something. He wants to create a battery that will like, you know, save energy, help the environment, and hopefully make him very, very rich. And she's like, man, that's so cool. You know, follow your dreams, love that. One day while at school, Melinda's sisters come to the school to let her know that their mother had passed. Robert comes to the wake to make sure that she's okay and everything. While there, she ends up driving him back to his home, which is actually an RV. Basically his mother had passed and his father was in prison. Anyway, a lot of like family stuff that resulted in him living alone in this trailer. What ultimately ends up happening is they end up having sex that day. Now, some people, here's the thing. Some people were really like, why are you why are you having sex? Like, why is that important? But grief is a weird, a very weird emotion. So anything, I used to judge people about like that they do when bereaved. And I'm like, not anymore, not anymore. Grief is a weird time. So that doesn't, that that isn't even weird to me that she had sex with him 
it really isn't. But what I do find very interesting in, in the context of this movie is that even the voiceover kind of acknowledges this, this sequence of events, right? She kind of chastises herself and chastises him for taking advantage of her in this context. Like he knew she was vulnerable. Her mom had literally just died. My mother wasn't even cold in the ground yet. And there I was. What kind of man takes advantage of a girl's grief, huh? Which again, I think is more indicative to him being this kind of quiet danger, if that makes sense. He is, I think, a more realistic villain, if that's what I wanna call him. As the movie goes on, it's hard to call either of them villain or hero, cause there is this idea that one is good and one bad. But the film through Melinda even acknowledges how, how predatory this is. It was an icky thing for him to do, this quiet, user that's kind of what you get the sense of throughout the movie or at least particularly the first half of it speaking of him being a user melinda's sisters pick up on it very quickly one is a bit more aggressive about it she's like who are you what are you what do you want like you feel like some bull but they're particularly concerned as they start to date because afraid that he's gonna take advantage of the fact that Melinda was left, I think it was $300,000 or $350,000 when the mom passed as well as the family house. So they're like, don't tell him you have this money. Don't tell him you have this house. He's gonna take advantage of you, but she's young and in love. So what does she do? Tell him about the house and the money. <laughs> Robert tells Melinda of his dreams of working for a company called Prescott Industries, which essentially buys new technology. He's trying to get his batteries seen by Prescott. And he basically tells Melinda, like, once my battery takes off, you know, we're gonna have it all. We're gonna have a private jet. We're gonna live in the top of, you know, these high rise buildings. I'm gonna give you a boat and call it the Miss Gale, which is his last name. And that was his way of essentially saying, I want to marry you. And again, in a way that I find incredibly skillful. Again, Robert isn't an overtly abusive person. He's not yelling and screaming or hitting her or anything like that. Is abuse even the right word? He's a, he's a manipulative person, that's the word, where he'll just kind of suggest things and be like, man, I could really use a car, dog. What if I need to go to Prescott and I gotta wait for the bus? Oh no. I could use a car. And then what does she do? She buys him a car. So there goes some of the money that she was left. And after buying this car, he seems to grow distant. Like he won't call her. He'll only talk to her if, if she calls him. And so one day she got suspicious. And so she calls him and he kind of treats her like a buddy. He's like, hey, pal. And she's like, pardon? And so she, with her intuition drives over to his home, his mobile home. And she sits there and stokes it out only to realize that he is indeed with another girl. He's cheating on her. In a fit of unbridled rage, Melinda drives her truck into the RV, hitting it twice and toppling it over. Robert and the girl, her name is Diana, I think, come out of the RV and Melinda is still raging. She takes a cinder block, throws it, through the, the window of the car that she bought. Girl, that's your car. I'm sorry, there is no, sometimes you just gotta say, well, I'm single then. <laughs> Can I just do a little PSA side note? Don't ever let anybody, especially a man, get you this angry. Once she gets out of her car, she passes out because she actually got internal bleeding from the crash and hit the steering wheel so hard against her abdomen that it ended up rupturing her ovaries. She had to get a full hysterectomy and now can't have kids because she couldn't just say, well, f that nigga and left. She got so mad that she had internal bleeding and now can't have kids. But does she leave him? Of course not, the movie's not over. He goes to the hospital, her sister, one of her sister in particular, cusses um, him out because he deserves it. And after she's out of surgery, they talk to her about her anger. Apparently, Melinda has struggled with anger her entire life. And they allude throughout the movie that it might be, you know, something that she got, you know, from her daddy. He used to go into rages and stuff. She gets so mad that she can't even see straight and she does destructive and horrible things. And now it's resulted in something that can't, she can't take back, you know what I mean? She can't like change the events of what happened. She now will never be able to have kids. And it was something that she had, you know, vocalized earlier that was an aspiration for her 
and Robert when they get married. Robert comes to boo-hoo, tell you, baby, baby, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean, I love you so much, please take me back, baby, please. And what does she do? She takes him back. I'm sorry, I just, I don't know. I've never been in love, so I, I don't wanna speak on like what I would and wouldn't do. I'ma just say I would be fucking surprised if I did this. And if I did, somebody sit me down. Now, during a particularly badly filmed scene, the bench was in the wrong direction, not even facing the water. Anyway, Robert tells her that he had lost his scholarship and that he wouldn't be able to pay for college and he doesn't know what he's gonna do. I don't have $73,000. And so what does she do? She pays for his last two semesters of school. And after she's done held him down and yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. He finally proposes with like a bubble gum ring and he promises her that he's gonna create a new ring once he has money and he's able to like, you know, put her in the sky rise apartment and private jet and then yada, 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 once his battery takes off and yahoo. -hoo. And so she tells her sisters, hey, I'm about to get married. And they're like, this is a horrible idea. And if you're gonna marry this man who cheated on you, was taking all your money and using you and yada, 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 if you're gonna marry this person, I'm not going to the wedding. And so they don't go to the wedding. She's there all by herself getting married. The only person that was kind of there for her was her friend. I don't even know if they even name her. So time starts to pass and slowly but surely, Melinda ends up using all of that money that her mother left her on parts for his battery, the bills, keeping him afloat, trying to keep their house afloat. Meanwhile, he's a full-time student and doing his little battery or whatever and not bringing in any money. So she takes up two jobs so that she can support them while he continues to do school and finish his battery. Cool, great, whatever. So he finally graduates. Melinda is so relieved because she's like, oh my God, thank God he's graduating. He already has three job offers right out of college. So finally, I will stop having to work and slave so hard. Again, I can imagine just grows in resentment. But lo and behold, all three turn him down because he's actually a felon and he didn't tell Melinda. So when he was 15, he was in a gang and he robbed a bank with that gang and he was sentenced as an adult for two years in prison or juvie or whatever. And he thought it would be expunged from his record, but nope, it's still there. He will, he is a felon. And so because of that, these places didn't wanna hire him. So it's back to him not working but working on his battery and her working, doing various odd jobs to keep them afloat. So I'm a Capricorn gang gang. So the quickest way to piss me off is to piss me off in regards to money. How did you mess up the fundamentals of how we like live so badly? I'd have to kill him. Again, I've said this, <laughs> like he would have to die. Me personally, I would have never married him because if you cheat on me, that's enough to tell me that you don't make good decisions in any way, like there's an impulsive even if you didn't want to cheat on me, you just said, hey, it was there and I took it and you know, I just slipped and fell in a pussy. Even if that were the case, you just make bad decisions and I don't wanna be married to that. So I would've broke up with him. Now he's out of school, no job prospects and they're in a hole. So now he's just really banking on that Prescott thing. He's like, it's okay, baby. We'll we're gonna, we're gonna make it. I'm gonna give you the house and the skylines and the hills and shit. Gotta believe the dream, honey, hey. But in the meantime, because they have so many money issues, Melinda makes the very, very difficult decision to mortgage their home or her mother's home that she worked so hard to pay for. So years begin to pass. Melinda starts to remark about how they just kind of float around each other. There's nothing to mark the passage of time because they don't have kids. Moments of their first birthdays and them graduating and all those things that kind of pinpoint the passage of time they just kind of drift around each other for like 18 years. His battery still hasn't hit, so they still have no money. And she ends up like working an office job. All these years, Robert has continuously been trying to contact the people at Prescott to get them to hear about his damn battery, which at this point is like 20 years old technology. Do they give a f anymore? I'm sure somebody's made something similar or better. One day, while again trying to get the attention of Prescott, he ends up in front of the building where he sees Diana, the girl that, I think that's her name, Diane, Diana. The chick that he had sex with in the beginning of the movie that he cheated on his now wife with, right? And apparently now, 
serendipitously, she is a big executive at Prescott. They schmooze a little bit about old times, particularly that night where she almost died in his RV because he had a girlfriend. He kind of asked for her to put a good word in for him and his damn battery. She's like, no, <laughs> but ultimately gets beaten down and she's like, sure, I can see what I can do. We can go for coffee or something, right? Completely platonic, nothing sexual by any means. Sure, we can talk, whatever. But that day he actually gets a call from the security manager at Prescott who's like, we have filed you as a credible threat all these years, you keep sending all these damn letters to look at your damn battery. And we've told you over and over again, that's not how this works. It's through a raffle. You can't browbeat us into looking at your freaking stuff. You're now on the credible threat list. Don't come to the building. Don't come talking to the people here. Don't call us. Don't send no letters. Bye. Robert blows a gasket. This was his final chance for success. And they have officially said, if you come here again, we gonna have problems. And so he gets mad, throws the table, has a fit, hyperventilates essentially. And here comes his very exhausted and tired wife, Melinda, who says, you say you want all this for me. You want these planes and you want these trains and you want these buildings and the high rises and the boat and yada yada. Have you ever asked? What I want, all I want you to do is get a job. Leave this damn battery alone, get over this damn battery and help me play some bills, okay? We're doing rough out here. He's like, fine, fine, I'll get a job. 20 years of no job, him working on his damn battery. He's like, sure, I'll get a job. Being that he does have a felony record, it is hard for him to get work, but he wasn't even trying to do anything. Now the nosy sisters find out that the house is getting foreclosed on and they're like, look, this was our mom's house. Do you know how hard our parents worked for this house? It was paid off. Like what the hell was happening? Here's the thing. If he needs a job, fine. He can work this delivery job that we, they have like a delivery company now. He can work this delivery job and we had to get an advance on this job so that you can get paid so that we can help you with this damn house. But look, we can't miss any freaking shipments because they'll take our trucks away. They'll take everything away because we're taking out essentially a giant loan to help y'all. So you have to do this job and don't mess it up, dog, seriously. And he's like, fine, I'll do it. But as he's getting like chastised by the whole family by her whole side of the family at the end of it instead of realizing you put us in this predicament he plays victim and he's like well why didn't you defend me they end up in this fight that makes them kind of draw apart because he's like she should have defended me he kind of ices her out he starts to sleep on the couch and yada 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 and melinda starts to wonder if he's cheating on her because he's so withdrawn and they haven't had sex in a very long time, you know, if time passes or whatever. So while this fight is happening, the executive woman that he bumped into before, that the one that he once cheated with, she's looking at his videos. Over the years, he had perfected this battery and he was just trying to get Prescott to, you know, actually look at it. So one day while doing one of the incredibly important shipments, he gets a call from Diana Diane, Diana, that lady. And she's like, I've convinced Prescott to see you. You have to come in today at 1130. Now he's in the middle of his job. Again, the very important run that he has to do. Keep in mind, if he screws this up, it doesn't just screw up for him. It screws up for the entire side of her family. So the sisters and their husbands and them. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go to Prescott. So what does he do? He foregoes again, this very, very important shipment. Go home, get in a suit get his battery that he had thrown away. The brothers notice that the car is changing course because they have a tracker in it. And they're like, he's going back home. Why is he going back home? And then one of the sisters finds Diana lady's wallet in one of the cars because she had left it on probably one of the days that they went to get coffee to talk about his dreams and aspirations or whatever. And so they go to tell Melinda, hey, we found this in old dude's car. He cheating on you. So the brothers-in-law, they come and they're like, you almost screwed up our whole business. And they're like, what the hell is wrong with you? Take the keys and go to make this shipment. In the meantime, Melinda gets home and she's like, what was this wallet doing in your car? He tries to explain everything, but he's like, I don't have time to explain. I gotta go to Prescott. I gotta go to Prescott. And she's like, where the hell are you going? 
There's a scuffle. The sister thinks that he's trying to hit her and it's not that. She takes his keys so he can't go via the car. So he goes on the bus and he starts to freak out because of the event that just happened. And Diana is there like, you look like shit. What is going on? And basically he tells her that his wife thought that they were cheating with each other because she dropped her wallet in there and she's like, ah, crap. But before they have time to really talk about that, she's like, this is the this is the meeting of your lifetime. You can do this. I believe in you, black man. Like after 20 years of research, they offer him a whopping $800,000, which to me, is not enough money. <laughs> not that it's anything to scoff at, and, you know. Considering how long he'd been working on this shit and how much he thinks it's so valuable, and a thousand, you getting less than a million dollars for that? Absolutely not. But given his context and his circumstances, about to get foreclosed, about to get foreclosed, he finally gets in there after 20 years of research, he, you know, all these things. I understand the pressure, right? Um, and honestly, if I were in that circumstance, I would take it for the betterment of my family. However, he's like, nah. And so he leaves. So now let me remind you that everybody's <laughs> the sisters and their husbands, his wife, the house is gonna be gone. Now he presumably was just hanging out with the woman that he cheated on her with 20 years ago. And this is just all too much. So when he goes home and he explains, this is why I wasn't doing anything with her. She's an executive at Prescott. I was really just trying to get seen and they offer me $800,000. Not a particular file on my video going corrupted. So I have to fill this in with voiceover. It's fine, it's cool. You'll see my pretty face again. <laughs> so Robert goes goes to Melinda, tells her that though they are about to get foreclosed on and that he's about to run out of all opportunities to save their house and their lives and livelihoods, he said, I said it wasn't a good offer, so I didn't take it. And so after these compiling agitations and frustrations and infuriating circumstances and possibly him cheating on her, she doesn't know. She finally reaches her breaking point and says, I want a divorce. The house is foreclosed on three months later and Belinda moves into her sister's house, something that greatly embarrasses her as she's now in her forties. Meanwhile, Robert is staying at a men's shelter. Belinda starts seeing the boyfriend that she had before she started dating Robert, a man named Devin, who is also recently divorced. And one day while they're at dinner, Melinda notices that Robert is actually working in the kitchen and she She's infuriated at the thought of all the promises he told her about how they were gonna live in, you know, these high rise mansions and they're gonna make it and they're gonna have all this money and they're gonna live this dream. And here he was working in the kitchen and she just grew more and more angry at the thought of it. She remarks to herself about how she would never feel repaid unless he paid her back $1.2 million, the amount of money that she calculated is what she spent over the course of their relationship, investing in him and paying off the bills as they live together. At their divorce hearing, he gives a speech about how he loves her and always has, and that he's always going to love her. Also how he did not cheat on her during their marriage, but ultimately they both sign the papers and they are now officially divorced. In comes the title screen for the next part of the film called Sunder, meaning to split, separate, or divide. And this is the chapter on their separate lives. Robert ends up being kind of adopted for all intents and purposes by the Diana lady and she um, works to sort of heal his wounded ego some people just don't see your vision and and i can understand how this part could come off as if we're like stroking the the bum ego <laughs> that i heard some people kind of voicing frustrations about but i don't think that's what this is it's just like with the information that she had with the experiences she had with him it's easy for her to say how wonderful he is, right? She hasn't been living with him for the last 20 years. Again, it's another situation where people are working off of the information that they have and they're doing things accordingly. And, and him believing in his mind that he did the right thing latches on to this encouragement. One day after over 20 years of trying to get Prescott to actually see his vision, they decide to offer him $150 million for his battery. Robert has finally made it. And then in an effort to make amends with Melinda, he goes to her job, dressed in a suit with flowers. She insists that if you're here to try to get me back, I don't want you, we're never getting back together. 
please leave me alone. But he's not there to get back together. He's there to thank her, apologize to her, and to offer her $10 million and the deed to her mother's home back. And this scene, I think, is very pivotal in the the trajectory of the narrative and the moral of the story, right? I think a lot of people internalize this as like, um, we're supposed to feel sympathetic for Robert. We're supposed to feel happy for Robert or any of these emotions. And sure, you could feel those things. But I think what's more important as opposed to Robert, him being a more sympathetic or not sympathetic character, is how Melinda goes from here, right? She says that she doesn't want to be back with him. She just wants her $1.2 million. So now she's gotten over, what is math? Um, 9.2, 9.8, 8.8 million dollars more than she thought that she deserved before. She has the deed to her house back. She's not with Robert anymore. Presumably these are all the things that she said she wanted and more so. And theoretically, in some way, this is best case scenario, no? <laughs> he, he, he's still trash. I feel like even if he wasn't cheating on her, he was willing to let his wife go through all that to support his dream that we didn't know was gonna come through. Melinda didn't know, probably he didn't know was gonna come through, right? So this is the best case scenario. He got money, you don't have to be married to him anymore. He gave you the money, you guys are on relatively good terms. Theoretically, this is <laughs> where the movie should end, but this is a movie about anger. It's a movie about resentment. And just because theoretically she shouldn't have that anger doesn't mean that it's gone. It, it has a new place to fester, a new place to present itself. Anger can be so greedy and insidious as it does Melinda throughout the rest of this movie. It completely obscures her ability to recognize that, again, theoretically, this is best case scenario. You should just kind of count your losses as far as like, losing a relationship with a person that kind of wasn't great anyway. You made money from it and go about your life. Like, <laughs> And what we'll see as the last few parts of this movie go on is that that anger has completely made her unable to be able to see that and instead just pushes her over to the edge and builds upon itself, compiles upon itself, all of this like festered anger, undealt with anger. We enter into chapter three, which is Bewail, which is the chapter on regret, disappointment, and bitterness. Melinda, after hearing that his battery hit, is immediately regretful and remorseful and angry. And she takes this out on her sisters who were only trying to do what was best based off of the information that they had, right? He wasn't treating her well. And that didn't change. He still was not treating her well, but now it paid off and she wished she wouldn't have listened to her sisters. So she goes off on them, curses at them, says that their husbands are cheating on them and yada, you know, has this very bitter and regretful and, and resentful outburst. And then afterwards she goes to Robert's penthouse and she's like, oh my God, this is everything you said it would be. And I'm so happy for for us, you know, we can finally have that life that you said that you saw for us. She goes there to seduce him only to realize that he is now engaged with the, the CEO woman. And she starts to resent that this woman will now live the life that she was always promised. Which again, you just got $10 million, buy it yourself, just let it go. <laughs> Instead of relishing in this new life that she can create with herself, again, with $10 million, you can do something. Um, she moves back into her mother's house, doesn't furnish it, and becomes obsessed with their relationship because now this woman is essentially living the life that she always thought she was deserving of. They're going on trips to Paris like he promised her. They have private jets like she was promised. They get the boat, call it the Mrs. Gale, but it's not her. Sucks, don't get me wrong. I, I can see why it sucks. I can empathize with the pain because that sucks, but also $10 million by your own damn boat. Combination of negative emotions, this resentment, this anger, this jealousy starts to send her into a spiral. She starts to drink more. She starts to create fake accounts where she's just harassing the new Mrs. Gale or the soon to be Mrs. Gale. And while this is happening, she's just isolating herself more and more and more. And her sisters get really worried. They find photos of the new woman with knives stabbed in her face. They're like, she's 
having a breakdown. Melinda tries to sue Robert for more of the money from his invention of the battery, essentially stating that she's the reason why he had the resources to research this battery. Um, she supported him. The judge says, well, he made this money after you were divorced. And two, even if it was based off of your investment of what you calculate to be $1.2 million, he gave you $10 million just without being asked to do so. He he repaid you and then some. So like, no, bye, let it go, <laughs> let it go, essentially. But Melinda can't let go. She has this moment after the court hearing that's not the best well done. <laughs> So there's an element about it that's very disturbing, but also kind of hilarious. Yeah, they could have did that scene better where she live streams how she's being taken advantage of by these people. Guys, hold on. Oh, okay. Okay. Hey, created such a deep injustice towards her and, and yada yada. And it's really getting to a head and her sisters basically say, we got to get her some help and Robert, please be on board with us to do that. Um, you may wanna consider getting some security for your wedding because she's losing her mind. Melinda ends up coming home while Robert is being talked to by the sisters and, and the new fiance is there as well and has a breakdown. She was pissed. And that was a pretty good scene. I feel like people undermine, on a side note, that again, there are moments where Taraji goes a little overboard, but it is melodrama. And she's at this high frequency anger the entire movie. She has this breakdown and she's like, why would you bring her here? What's wrong with y'all? What type of family are y'all? Why would you let him bring her here? So disrespectful. What kind of family are you? And I was like, damn, I actually felt that. Again, obsessed with their relationship, had reserved the wedding dress that she had always wanted for her wedding. She pours acid on the clothes and is brought back into court. If anything's fake about this about this movie is that they didn't send her ass to jail immediately. She's a black woman and possibly mentally ill. There ain't no way in hell they wouldn't have put her ass in jail already. You are harassing this couple. The fiance is like, well, I mean, it works out because I couldn't have fit it anyway because I'm pregnant. It's okay, your honor. I couldn't fit the dress anymore anyway. This little one's growing pretty fast. Um, which is like, like the final straw for Melinda, because if you recall, she can't have kids. She had a hysterectomy. And they were like, you need to go to counseling. You need to get some help for your anger. Hence the return to the beginning of the movie, her in counseling with a therapist. Now having told the entire story of why she's so f angry. The therapist says something along the lines of, have you ever considered that he was being honest? Would you feel better if he was really being honest and he really meant well? If you found out that he was operating out of the purest intentions, like he wasn't trying to be awful, he just was, but he was genuinely trying to be a decent person, but just failed at being so, would you be able to let it go? And instead of internalizing it as that question, or even considering it in that way, she shuns the idea and digs her heels and says, I am not wrong. I am not wrong for being angry, which is a different argument. She, she internalizes it as you don't have a right to be angry, as opposed to you completely have the right to be angry. It's understandable that you're angry. What's the problem here? That you're letting it lead to your detriment. That's a better like interaction than I think people, there's so much I think in this movie that's better than gets credit for if that makes sense. And there's another line earlier that also alludes to this where she says, I would burn a house down just to take other people with me. That's how angry I get. And that's a very, powerful concept, right? Then this happens where the counselor essentially alludes to, have you considered or have you heard of something called borderline personality disorder? Which if you follow my other videos in this series that I do here, I have talked about how I get greatly uncomfortable when mental health is brought up to some degree in movies like this. The core conundrum I have and the kind of like thorny, moral question of how mental health is represented in film particularly is that it is disproportionately representative in like murderers, criminals, you know, stuff like that, as opposed to balanced out with other narratives of people just suffering from mental health issues, right? And that doesn't necessarily result in them being criminals or 
violent or dangerous. Kind of the thing I've always said is that just, you have to have something wrong with you to do certain things. <laughs> like you have to have something not all there to make like a lampshade out of skin, Ed Gein. There's something off. <laughs> You're not all okay up there to do that. But not everyone that's not okay up there is making lamps out of skin. You feel me? So at first I was quite uncomfortable with like explicitly trying to diagnose her. But as the scene continued, I realized that this is actually quite, again, a very nuanced scene. Really brings to a head kind of the warnings everyone has tried to give Melinda through the entire movie. She's in a place to get help for her anger, for her, her outbursts, for her negative spiraling emotions. And she's, she's giving a possible reason for why she's having a lot of trouble to regulate her emotions, right? In a way that's kind of shown as her folly throughout this entire movie, she completely rejects the notion of needing help for anything, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. Cause if you recall, again, throughout the entire movie, it's alluded to her always being a very angry person before she met Robert, before she met Robert, even as a child, she would have these outbursts, right? And then her sisters were like, you get so angry and you can't even see straight. You get so mad and you wanna burn the house down with you in it. There's this, there's this cycle of people saying, hey, you need help, you need help, you need help. Please get some help, please get some help, please get some help. And ultimately what is the final straw is that she's given this opportunity to help herself and she actively and explicitly rejects it. Yeah, she's crazy because she's had borderline personality disorder. It's less about that. It's like, she's a person who has an issue and is actively ignoring treatment as this is coming to a head, right? Better done than say like the roommate, like, yeah, she's trying to kill people because because she's crazy. Like, no, this is someone who has a problem and has been ill for presumably her entire life. And we're finally coming to an understanding of that. We're also there in this kind of like Greek tragedy type way. You're just trying to call me crazy. And she walked out. I thought it was a, I thought it was a pretty good scene actually. Robert goes on to marry the woman. They end up getting the boat, calling it the Mrs. Gale. She ends up being given the ring that Robert said that he would give to Melinda if he finally made it, you know, he gave her a little bubblegum ring, but he said, yeah, I'll give you the ring with these diamonds and that diamond, whatever. And Melinda is just in her festering anger and her siblings and um, their husbands are outside trying to keep her inside the house because she needs an intervention. And again, you got $10 million right? She has $10 million. If she want to go and buy a boat, she can buy a boat. She can go to Paris. She can buy her own damn ring. But no, she's in this anger so deeply. She ends up jumping out of a window and sneaking out of the house. And that leads into our last chapter, which is the one on inexorable, 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 inexorable apparently. Okay. Meaning unforgiving, relentless, inflexible. And this is the final scene on the boat. So the newlyweds are on their honeymoon. They're on this boat. They're just looking at the stars, enjoying their time. Not the best CGI by the way, but whatever. New wife goes down into the cabin where she's going to run a bubble bath and call for him later. And here comes Melinda who has stolen her wedding dress and is currently wearing it. She has a gun and she's threatening to kill Robert. With a gun pointed to his face, he insists that he never cheated on Melinda and that he's always loved her and that he didn't do this thing that she says that he did. And she says, well, if that's the case, tell that bitch to jump off and we can live the life that we were always meant to live, right? Before I get started on the rundown of the scene, I think this is where people give it its most criticism because this scene is kind of, a mess. <laughs> it is. It's admittedly a mess. Um, the execution wasn't great, but I get what they were getting at, right? There are some elements that I feel very like melodramatic to the extent of like uh, almost caricature-esque even of other thrillers, if that makes sense. So I get it. It's not the best scene in the world. She ends up shooting him either on accident or just like, I don't know. She seems surprised that she did it. So she's like, oh my God. She shoots him in the stomach and the crew comes out and she tells them all to jump overboard. That funny. Something about how they were screaming like, ah! 
And the wife comes up to see what's going on and she sees that Melinda's there with a gun. So she's trying to run away very, very slow. And Melinda's like, stop moving, bitch. Give me my ring, the ring that she always wanted. And while she's holding the gun at her, Robert uses his last strength to yeet her off the boat. And in quite the meme fashion, she materializes back on the boat. It's all your fault, Robert. A mess. That was a mess. It was a mess. I didn't say the movie's perfect, okay? I said it I said it has its moments is what I said. So she materializes very supernatural onto the boat. Oh, but before that happens, Robert's telling um the new wife like, "Hey, get on that tugboat, find the crew. I'm bleeding out. Get help. I'm about to die." So she goes off into a little tugboat to find the crew who's in dark water. They dead already now, sis. If they not dead, they done swam somewhere. Melinda finds an ax hitting his leg but it, in horrible cgi and her leg gets caught in the anchor drug down by a chain in water remember the reference of crazy stuff always seems to happen to me in water she also referenced rain throughout the movie as well and she's literally drugged down by the result of her own anger the new wife found that crew and they're not at all wet and they're not at all like F going back on that boat i don't get paid enough for this sh but she brings them back and they find Robert either unconscious or dead. I have no idea. And then the credits roll and that's the end of the movie. Now, I can understand why people don't like this movie. I, I will preface by my ending comments that I understand if you don't like this movie, I understand why you don't. Cause there again are some quality issues. The weird green screen sometimes is off-putting. The ending scene just execution wise, is a mess. <laughs> and of course, again, there are some recycling of trite tropes of the an angry black woman drama and the patience and coddling needed to actualize the potential of black men. But again, I just feel like there's so much more to this movie than that. I think the most fascinating thing about this movie is that there isn't really a villain and there really isn't a hero either. I think between the two, if there's like a scale or a spectrum, Robert is certainly more of the villain here. <laughs> I definitely think he's more of the villain here throughout the movie, but less than this kind of very stagnant dichotomy between the, the, the hero and the villain. I think what's more fascinating is that neither of them are right or wrong in certain contexts. They're just people going off of the information that they think that they have and the decisions that they think are best and they do and don't play out. And at that point, all that we're left with are our choices and the consequences of those choices. They all could have done things differently right? He could have not cheated on her in the beginning, which means that she wouldn't think he'll cheat on her in the future. Maybe would have believed him more when he said that he didn't cheat on her and that we don't have to get divorced. Or she could have just stopped being with him when he cheated on her the first time. Or when he did cheat on her, she didn't have to drive her truck into there. He could have told her he was a felon and she, maybe she wouldn't have married him. And maybe he could have got a job, anything, and just focused more on that as opposed to the the battery. All of these things that they coulda, shoulda, woulda, whatever done. Like, was Melinda wrong for being angry that he wasn't working when she's about to lose her mother's house? No. But was she wrong for holding on to her resentment to the extent that it ruined her ability to see that she has the potential to have a completely different life now and one that could be even more fulfilling than being married to him? Was he wrong for relishing in, in, in his hard work, you know? No. But was he wrong for putting that much stress onto his wife the entire time they were married? Yeah. Yes, he was. I think this movie more than anything is a cautionary tale on how we deal with anger, how we deal with resentment, how that can take us on a tailspin when that isn't necessarily where this has to go. You know what I mean? Again, as an audience, we're seeing him do all this shit, right? We understand and empathize with why you're angry, cause I would be too. We understand that she's angry, but the problem is there's still a responsibility to not be as destructive as she was with that anger. Especially because again, she was kind of restored in all the ways that she said that she had lost things, right? She got her house back, she made 
10 million dollars she's not married to his annoying ass no more i mean but she still loved him so i guess to her degree like she was owed that was the final thing that he could not restore and she could not let that go right and it ended up being her downfall and possibly his we don't know if he survived or not i think what's interesting is that there are no real good people in this movie per se. And there's no really, well, Robert's pretty trash. <laughs> I was gonna say, he he he's more trash than he isn't, you know what I mean? But that dichotomy is almost a non-factor. It's almost not as interesting, I think. I think what's more interesting is the idea of two people living their lives based off of the information that they feel like they have and making choices off of that information while walking into the unknown. That while making those choices, things may not turn out the way that you thought it would. And it's a cautionary tale of that, if that were to happen, don't lose yourself. Don't let it consume you and be to your detriment. Also in conversation with why this movie I find is quintessentially better than other works that Tyler Perry has done, because again, he has scrutinized black woman anger before, but I find it refreshing to some degree that he decided to take away the prospect of that being healed by another man. Like I just found a better man. I found a light skinned black man to, <laughs> to, to take away the pain that this dark skinned black man made. And instead the cure for that quote unquote, or the accountability for that, the resolution for that, the healing from that is all within oneself by proxy. So too is the destruction from that. So yes, there it is. That's my stance. I like this movie. Oh, I'll also say this. I have no interest in trying to convince you to like the movie. That's not why I made this video. I'm just saying, I think there's more to it. I don't know, maybe if you watch the movie after this and kind of think of it in that way, you might find more enjoyment in it. And if not, that's also cool. It's just a movie, chill out, sis. Some people get very, very, very impassioned about certain things. It's not good for you. It can lead to your downfall. <laughs> that, my friends, is all for today, folks. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. If you have more opinions, Love to hear that. What are your analyses? If you've seen the movie already, put that down in the comment section. And if you have other recommendations for bad movies, feel free to put them down in the comment section and I will see you guys next time. Bye.